La classe de gramàtica vam aprendre que del singular naixia el plural. La vida, com a poeta, ens convida a pensar que l'únic lloc del que pot emergir el singular és del plural en el que hem nascut. Abans d'arribar a ser qui som en singular, som un més en la comunitat que ens ha vist néixer. No serà que si aprenem a llegir el món al revés començarem a entendre'l millor? No serà cert que la responsabilitat educativa resideix tant en la ciutadania i les seves diverses maneres de viure com en els centres educatius específics? No serà que si la ciutat es pren seriosament la seva funció educadora, el plaer per saber-ne més no tindrà límit i la protecció del col·lectiu serà un veritable objectiu en ell mateix? Qui sap quin és el dret i el revés de l'experiència vital d'aprendre? M'ha sortit bé aquesta frase, eh? Que sí, la torno a dir. Qui sap qui és el dret i el revés de l'experiència vital d'aprendre? Aquest és el nucli del dia d'avui. I ara us presento a la meva amiga estimadíssima Sonetra Gupta. Vaig convidar la Sonetra Gupta perquè reuneix en ella dues especialitats que no són fàcils de veure juntes. Ella és zoòloga i novel·lista. És a dir, es belluga simultàniament en el món de la recerca epidemiològica de malalties com ara la malària i en el món de la ficció escrivint històries on el plural és sempre molt present. La Sonetra va néixer a Calcuta i quan jo la vaig conèixer per primera vegada jo li vaig explicar una conversa que havia tingut amb una senyora gran africana que vivia aleshores a les afores de Dakar i que em va dir vosaltres, els europeus, us equivoqueu de dalt a baix. Compreu segones residències a tocar de casa vostra i quan sigueu vells tindreu de tot menys algú que de veritat s'ocupi de vosaltres i us mantingui vinculats a la comunitat. El que hauríeu de fer, vosaltres, els europeus, els rics, és comprar les segones residències a l'Àfrica i assegurar-vos així del que és realment important. La Sonetra ràpidament em va dir m'agradaria conèixer, t'agradaria, és a dir, a mi, t'agradaria conèixer la meva mare. El món de cadascun dels seus personatges va emergint al llarg de la història que es proposa explicar. La música social del rerefons canvia d'intensitat, però no es perd mai la seva presència. Ningú millor que ella per obrir el dia on el tema és del nosaltres a l'Ió. Thank you so much, Lali. It's just such a pleasure to be here. It's uh, like a dream come true, really. I first met Lali in 2006 in Melbourne, of all places. <laughs> We were standing in front of an aquarium, I remember, a very beautiful aquarium, and um, we started to talk, and that was the beginning of a very long friendship, a very long journey, and uh, it's just wonderful to be here as part of that journey. So, um, I decided to call, well, I've used this title before, um, to call it Thinking in Two Languages, My Adventures in Science and Literature. And I'd like you, of course, to um, think of language um, in all its possibilities. I'm hoping that as I speak, um, I'm not really just talking about scientific prose and literary prose. I'm talking about language in a very much broader and a much more general and nuanced way. So, um, I think my Catalan is, is non-existent that Lali mentioned that I was born in Calcutta and spent most of my formative years there. I mean, I still consider myself to belong um, to Calcutta. This photograph is actually from a little bit um, longer ago than when I was born. Um, but that's kind of how I remember it because, of course, you know, when you remember a place, you don't just remember it as you experienced it, but as it was, has been experienced by um, others before you. And um, my father, and that picture there is of me and my father, he was a very important, very central influence in my life and a lot of my experience of Calcutta was through him, not just his intellectual 
um, activities and, and what he imparted to me by way of uh, the love of literature and cinema and all of that, but also his own particular experiences in the 50s and 60s in this city. Um, I did spend some of my early childhood in, in Africa, and actually the first, uh, and although we spoke Bengali at home, it's my native language, uh, while I was in Africa, English was really the language that I first learned to read and write. We moved back to Calcutta when I was 11, and as I said, my, uh, through my father and, and other people, being part, I, I became very quickly immersed in the Bengali culture, and I'd already started to you know, write little stories and things in English, but once I moved back to Calcutta, I decided very much that I would commit to um, Bengali, that I would immerse myself in Bengali, and indeed the first works of fiction pu I published were in Bengali, and these were little sort of science fiction stories where I was, I suppose, in some ways trying to combine my interests in science and literature, and I found science fiction to be a, a very um, a fruitful, or, or at that time anyway, to be a, a, a wonderful way of, of being able to combine those. But just to say that while I, I mean, Calcutta at the time, and also in my experience of it through my father's experiences, was an intellectually extremely vibrant place. So here I've just um, shown some, um, that this is just a sort of mose a, a picture of um, a kind of collage of images that give you some idea of all the things that were happening. Uh, we had uh, very much on the stage for international cinema with Shotajit Ray directing uh, wonderful films as, as well as many others. There was a wonderful kind of um, movement in, in theater, um, art. That, that painting there is actually by Rabindranath Tagore, who many of you may know as a poet and a writer. He took up painting at the age of 70. That's when he took up painting. That's one of his paintings. And of course, literature itself was, was very, very vibrant. So, but um, in terms of two languages, that there was always this kind of discourse between Bengali, English, and here again is one of Tagore's poems, which he, you can see the sort of interweaving of, of English and Bengali there. Uh, Tagore was a very important and remains an extraordinary force in, in Bengali life and culture. Um, and another, what you see here is a, is a picture of him chatting to Einstein. So there was this, I think I, it would be fair to say I grew up in an atmosphere which is in fact described as a Bengali renaissance. Um, and this was uh, something that happened in the late 19th century in Bengal. Um, the collision of cultures and thoughts led to this kind of movement, this efflorescence of, of thought in which science, scientific thinking and literary thinking, the arts were kind of integrated um, in a whole. And I think that growing up in that kind of, or at least in the, in the wake of that culture was, was very helpful to me in that because I became interested at quite an early age in um, science as well as literature, uh, this did not seem to me to violate any kind of fundamental principles of life. Having said that, when I did, and I, and it, I didn't really become that interested in science until I was about 14 or 15, um, when suddenly mathematics, which had previously been this really dull subject, um, opened itself up to me as this incredibly poetic language. And I became fascinated by um, mathematics as well as biology. Um, not, so those equations that you see this, uh, that this young woman is wearing on her t-shirt and someone even more serious than her has actually tattooed on the back of their shoulder, on their back, are some equations by Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, which describe 
really the workings of the universe. And these equations, when I understood what they meant, to me seemed as poetic, I mean, as valuable in terms of their poetic possibilities as the poetry of, of Keats, for example, who I was a big fan of. At the same time, I was also very interested in natural history and the natural world and the, the beauties of the natural world. And when I say that, you know, this was all, I found it easy to integrate these interests um, within sort of the same framework um, that somewhat, um, uh, that I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, maybe glossing over some of, some of the others, other facts of my life. I mean, obviously there was um, some resistance from some quarters. I remember my father saying to me, why, why are you suddenly interested in science? I thought you were going to be a writer or a filmmaker or something. And of course, the truth is that I wanted to do both. Um, very fortunately, I then, um, well, actually, a set of rather unusual circumstances took me to do my undergraduate degree at Princeton University in the United States. But there I had the benefit of a liberal arts education, which did not oblige me to exclusively focus on one subject. So I, was, I went there thinking that I would, as a major, um, take up physics, because physics to me was this sort of ultimate kind of uh, expression of um, the poetry of mathematics. Physics embodied how mathematics could be applied to understand the universe. Uh, when I got to Princeton, I realized that you could also uh, use mathematics to understand biological systems. And I was very fortunate there to, um, under the guidance of Robert May, um, develop that as a uh, focal point of my studies. And indeed, that's what's become my career. So what I work on now is to uh, understand biological systems, and in particular, infectious disease systems using mathematical ideas. But as I'll show you in a minute, sometimes these can translate into some uh, very um, practical uh, public health solutions. At the same time, I was able to uh, work, attend creative writing workshops, and one of an important one that I went to was um, held by Joyce Carol Oates, and she certainly was very inspirational to me, very encouraging to um, carry on writing. And at this point, I had switched back to writing in English because, again, for three years, I'd been in an environment where I spoke. English and read, most of my reading was in English again, and so I started writing in English again. Um, to me, it was quite a natural thing and remains that way to switch from one language to another. It doesn't constitute any kind of betrayal. Um, I think language itself goes well beyond its existence at the level of particular kind of you know, Bengali or English, th those particulars. To me, a language is deeper than that, so I think what it's, it's a vehicle um, for expression. So it, to me, you know, what language you use to express yourself in is, is, it, is a matter of the circumstances you're placed in at the time. So it's, it's what works for you in that moment. Anyway, so I also... Um, carried on writing and, and started to write very seriously and decided I would um, try and write novels rather than just short fiction and have again been very fortunate so far to have published uh, five novels um, and I'm working on the sixth, although that's been going on for rather a long time, but hoping to finish that uh, sometime next year. So. As such, that's like the framework. That's what I've done with my life so far. Um, and for a very long time, until about 10 years ago, until about actually 
this is interesting because it goes back to the conference we were at in 2006. I, um, it's 2005 actually. Um, up to that point, I just did these things. You know, I, I was basically just trying to make time to do these things as well as having two young children. Then I just wrote when I could. I did the science. Obviously, it's my job. It's my day job. I didn't think too much about the links between them or what was going on or how to fit them together. It was just a matter of doing. And then this conference that Lali and I went to um, together in, in 2005, um, I mean, I was surprised to get this invitation. It was called the Conference on Thinking, and I was asked to deliver an hour's lecture. And I thought, well, what should I talk about? And I thought, well, maybe this is time. It's time now to think about how these two things I do fit together. Now, obviously, people had asked me before, how do you do these two things? Do you feel that you're a Jekyll and Hyde character, that you know, part, part of you just switches to the writer and then switches back to being the scientist? And those are really kind of superficial questions. And I, my general answer was no. I don't. I feel that they're all part of an integrated whole, which is me. Um, so I thought, OK, um, I, I'll start to think about the connections between these two activities. And I did, and, and the transcript of my talk was um, made public by um, one of the radio stations, without asking me, in fact. But um, an editor at Princeton University Press then came along and said to me, why don't you turn this into a book? So that, that was more than 10 years ago now. Um, so since then, I've been trying to write this book on the connections between science and literature. Um, and so what I thought, though, and, and it's been, it's, and it is an ongoing activity which I'm finding much pleasure in. So I thought perhaps I would start by giving you a flavor for the contrast, if you like, let's start first with the, the contrasts between my practice. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching this very much as a practitioner. I'm not, it's not my area of academic interest. As a practitioner, what do I have to say about how I personally see the links between what I do? And to do that, I thought, first of all, I might just um, read a bit from, um, I think I'll skip to... Um, And I'm going to stand here now because I can't read. Um, I'll just give you a sense of the, the textures of both my literary um, output and my scientific work. And then I'll explain to you what I think are the differences between them and also how they connect. So I'll just set the scene by just reading from, this is the opening paragraph of my most recent novel, So Good in Black. Child on the seashore, I loved your mother once. How unkindly these words pound through my blood as I walk down this dry path towards you. How cruelly they beat their rhythm within me as though already relentlessly rehearsed. I halt at the low iron gate that separates the garden from the beach. From here I have a good view of you, a slender young thing in a crimson frock. You stand with your feet planted slightly apart turning your head slowly from side to side, methodically surveying the various life forms deposited about you by the retreating sea. Those that you wish to save, you seem to be trapping under glass jars, into each of which, when uprighted with the sea creature squirming within, you ladle a liquid from a bucket by your side, sea water perhaps, or some other kind of nourishing brine. A dog barks, causes you to look briefly over your shoulder. I catch a glimpse of your delicate features, your large, quiet eyes. My head reels. Again, I feel a sickening familiarity with this precise moment, as if it might somehow already be embossed upon the meagre felt of my imagination, a moment such as this. So this is an example, obviously, of how I write. And I just wanted to contrast it with a 
recent um, scientific paper, which we've published. This paper just came out two weeks ago, and um, it's a work of which I'm very um, proud. Um, obviously, it's not, first of all, it's a hugely collaborative effort, and Craig Thompson, who is the first author of the paper, is um, the person who should get most of the credit for, for the work itself. Um, what the work, this work does is um, it, it lays, it creates a blueprint for making a new type of influenza vaccine. So the current flu vaccines that we have, which many of you, as many of you will know, since you, many of you will have probably received it, um, requires updating very regularly. So every year or every two or three years, you have to change the vaccine. And what we found is a new way of vaccinating against influenza, which um, will avoid this problem. So you can get one shot of flu and be protected for life. So it's a very exciting thing. And, but what's led, I just want to give you a sense, obviously I'm not gonna explain the science behind it. Just want to give you a sense of the different language that underlies this whole process. So first of all, the basis of this was a mathematical model that I developed about 10 years ago. And so I've put, show, I'm showing you up there the equations of this model. This model describes how the influenza virus evolves through time. Um, what Craig Thompson was able to do is take this model and do some experiments. The results, some figures, those figures there on the right show you are just, again, there to give you a flavor of how those experiments are um, conducted, the language of those experiments, how they're conducted, how they're presented in this paper to the public. We have experiments done vaccinating mice, the results of which are presented in graphs, showing how well they reacted to the potential vaccine. We have pictures like that, um, the one on the bottom corner there, right-hand corner there, which is the structure of the virus. This is what you see and how the region that we choose to focus on um, is uh, where it locates on the surface of this virus. So those are the languages, the, the, the particular uh, methodologies and languages that we use to put together this, um, th this whole um, uh, theory, this whole package. And as you can see, um, in the writing of, of the, that, that's just the abstract, it, it has a completely different tone. You know, current antigenic targets for the influenza vaccine de development are either highly immunogenic epitopes of high variability or conserved epitopes of low immunogenicity, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read it out. Um, so, th so you can see there are these sort of tonal and structural differences I just wanted to quickly also just show you, just before I, um, on, on Tuesday night, I was talking about this work to a public, uh, to uh, giving a public lecture on this, and what I use when I give public lectures on this work is this analogy, which I call the wardrobe analogy, where I talk about what, um, ah, okay, point, what each virus, different viruses have as wardrobes, I tell, ask people to visualize the virus as having a wardrobe, and I contrast measles and influenza by saying measles has a very limited wardrobe, whereas influenza has a very diverse wardrobe, and that's why we can make, easily make vaccines against measles, because you just take these pieces of its outfit and put them in a syringe, whereas it's very hard to pack all of this into one syringe. And then I explain what we have done which is we have challenged the dogma, the narrative of, the, that of the evolution of influenza, which is that it has a very diverse wardrobe and that indeed this is a linear narrative that influenza uses this wardrobe in a linear fashion, changing it regularly in, in a linear way. And that's why we have to keep updating our vaccine for influenza and what I, or the way I explain what we've done is by saying we have replaced this with a new narrative which is that the wardrobe is not so diverse and that there's some elements of its wardrobe, influenza's wardrobe, which are very limited in their variability 
and that if you can pick those areas, then you can make a vaccine which will not need updating. So all of this just by way of presenting to you the contrast between the languages, the idiom, the metaphors, um, and give you a sense of the narrative structures that are employed within um, both my practice of science and of literature. And perhaps just in my saying so, you can see where I'm leading. So this is, this is just a picture of where, what we're doing. So we've got made our vaccine out of those a part of the wardrobe that's limited, and this is what it looks like on the surface of the flu virus. This uh, vaccine is actually named after a rabbit I used to have, which is a bit of humor. <laughs> Interesting, again, you know, just to, I think, how does one tell a scientific story? Um, and then I use this sort of metaphor again of the, vac of the virus all dressed up, but with nowhere to go. So. What I'm trying to get across to you here is that it's all, we are still talking about telling stories. To go back to um, Ben Okri's amazing sort of um, session yesterday, his, his, his thoughts and words, it's very much about telling stories in both cases. But what, what really does that mean? At some level when you say, oh, this is all about telling stories, um, it can sound a little bit flippant sometimes. Yeah, telling stories, it's just like, you know, they're all the same thing. So I decided that wasn't enough. I needed to delve a little bit deeper into what, what does it mean? What, what are the elements of these stories? How are they different? How are they connected? And I thought first that I would start, I thought I would write this book, I would structure it in a very logical way. I would start with the word, and then I would move to the syntax, and then to the narrative, and whatnot. And that worked for a while. So if we look at it, if we think at the level of word, how does my practice, my literary practice, um, differ from my scientific practice? Well, one very obvious way, and, and this is very, um, this is, a uh, very fundamental difference between them, is that when I'm writing a piece of scientific prose or constructing a mathematical model um, for the evolution of the influenza, for example, I am very careful to make sure that the words I use or the mathematical symbols have no ambiguity in their meaning. Introducing ambiguity there is... is, um, is, is a sign of failure in some ways. It's the, the interest there is in creating, is in leaving no gaps between the words that you use and exactly what it refers to. So the word and the referent have to adhere as closely together as possible when I'm doing science. By contrast, when I'm writing, it's the gap between the word and what it's referring to where all the potential, all the energy lies. It's, it's the ambiguity, very ambiguity of the word and it's the relationship between the word and its referent that creates the magic, the mystery of writing. So that's a very important distinction. When I'm writing, I want that gap to swell when I'm um, when I'm writing literature, when I'm doing science, I want that gap to shrink. So that's one very fundamental difference. And then, of course, as uh, it's immediately obvious in looking at contrasting this piece with the, all the scientific stuff I was, uh, I've just been exposing you to, um, I use grammar in a very different way. Uh, when I'm writing scientific prose, I use it fairly conventionally trying to adhere to the rules um, of grammar, as it were. Um, I use semicolons a lot. Um, you know, my intention is to achieve clarity, is to communicate um, very clearly and specifically what I want to do. Uh, whereas when I started to write, I didn't, I didn't set out with any intention when I started to write literature of using grammar in any particular way, but when I sat down to write, it all came out like this, which is not uh, conventional, as it were. 
And what I realize is that my response to grammar is actually, when I'm writing fiction, is very visceral. It, it's something that really comes out, it's, it's, it's a response, it's an emotional response. And this is true of many writers of fiction, actually. Ah, okay, this has got a little bit messed up. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Anyway, so what I realize is not only is my attitude towards punctuation visceral, um, there are many other writers who um, uh, have this kind of response to punctuation. And I've since then been almost collecting, I've got like this cabinet of curiosities, which are these examples of how writers, other writers describe um, their attitudes towards punctuation. So what's behind, I don't know why this slide got messed up here. Somehow the next slide has become transposed um, onto the, <laughs> this side. But um, what, what's behind that is a th a three examples. Um, I remember reading in uh, Connor Cruz O'Brien's biography of Burke, he talks about brackets parentheses, as handcuffs on a sentence, which is just beautiful. Banville, John Banville, one of my um, favorite writers, um, behind that wall there, is t talks about a doctor stabbing a, uh, uh, a full stop, basically, into um, a death certificate. Um, and he also later talks, this is so beautiful, he talks about clinging to the present tense as I would to a cliff. The narrator of his wonderful novel, Athena, talks about that. And as I said, I, um, I have an aversion to using semicolons in fiction, in, in when I'm writing fiction, just have an aversion. Whenever I see it on the page, it just seems to me, no, 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 no. Whereas, but, but that is a very personal aversion. One of, again, one of my favorite writers, Virginia Woolf, uses punctuations, the punctu I mean, um, uses semicolon, like salt and pepper in her fiction, you know, it's just full of semicolons. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway there is just, you know, look at that, what she loved, life, so, uh, loved semicolon, life semicolon, London semicolon, this moment of June, it's just used so effectively, so beautifully, it appeals to me so much in her prose. When I try and use semicolons, I don't, I can't do it. And again, here are some other examples of people responding to semicolons. Arvind Maritra talks about the semicolon in a poem. I can't remember which. He says, the semicolon, the first sentence, is the osmotic membrane. And meanwhile, Kurt Vonnegut, with characteristic <laughs> insouciance, says, semicolons are transvestites, hermaphrodite, hermaphrodites representing absolutely nothing. So here we have different responses to punctuation and grammar. And once again, it's funny how things look different on screen <laughs> when you project them, but another uh, person who used punctuation very viscerally was Emily Dickinson. And of course, her original poems are strung full of dashes. But then people have interpreted those dashes in different ways. To Brenda Hillman, Emily Dickinson's dashes create the sensation of walking a rope bridge strung across a raging river far below, which I think is a fantastic way. That resonates with my feelings about how she uses dashes. Less so, um, I, I don't quite have the same affinity with Susan Howe's um, interpretation of them as stitches through her poems. Somehow that doesn't make sense to me. And Lyndall Gordon, who um, wrote about Emily Dickinson, um, beautifully talks about these dashes pushing language apart, creating spaces for the reader to fill. Remember yesterday, Ben was talking about spaces within paintings for us to fill. And then she says, so she talks about the provisional, how the dashes create this, the, the provisional, serve the provisional. With each dash, something nameless is breaking through the crust of the words, as though language were a crater, unsafe and stirring, which again takes you back to the rope bridge. So I think that in writing literature, punctuation serves a completely different purpose to what it does in writing scientific prose. But, so, so we've covered word, grammar, narrative. 
Uh, so all of this is coming together into some kind of structure. And this is where I realized how science and literature actually meet within me. This is where the practices converge. So I've told you how they uh, diverge, which is in the actual language itself, but in the construction narrative, they actually converge. And for a long time, I have wondered, I have thought about what it is that actually constitutes narrative and why it is that I don't like to, um, certainly in my fiction, um, I very rarely use the linear narrative as a form. So, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, um, but about 10 years ago, um, when I tried to publish my fifth novel, that met with a lot of resistance. And one of the um, objections against publishing it was that it didn't have uh, a linear, a very simple narrative form. And there was, at the time, this kind of um, obsession, if you like, which I think was entirely market-driven, personally, with the linear narrative. So people, grown people, would go around, people in the business of publishing, of writing, would go around saying, stories have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And obviously stories with beginning, middle, and end are kind of easy to, to follow. And in fact, stories beginning, middle, and end, or ones that um, have a linear narrative, um, are often you know, very wonderful, thought-provoking stories. Um, so the linear form, I'm not trying to discredit or discount the linear form as one valid way of telling a story, but it's not the only form. You know, if, here again, if you go back to the world of mathematics, the line is only one geometry. It's of many geometries. Stories, so mathematics offers us this possibility of many geometries, of a linear geometry, of a circular geometry, of what we call a fractal geometry, where very simple rules can lead to extremely complex shapes. And it's, to me, it was just curious that people, that there was this emphasis on the linear form, when again, I was drawn, particularly in my fiction, to exploring other forms. The linear form, I did not have a particular affinity for. Indeed, what I feel most comfortable with is perhaps what you might call the fractal form. And the fractal form, as I said, arises through the application of fairly simple rules that eventually end up with quite a complex structure. And this is something that's been elaborated on and elucidated by a mathematical theory called chaos theory. But what it, and what chaos does is it links, it makes, it distinguishes between um, arbitrary disorder and noise and something that is complicated, but underlying it, there is this sort of very stern um, structure. So it links, it says there's noise, but there's also something that, there's chaos, which is somewhere on the boundary between order and disorder. And there's be another beautiful quote from Lyndall Gordon where she mentions, where she says, art is made at the interface between abandon and decorum, which I think echoes my sentiments regarding um, narrative. Um, so, what this brings me to really is, is this idea that, you know, at the end of the day, stories come in two forms. There's the story that we tell each other, maybe over the dinner table, the story that people, there's a big argument that these stories have evolved, They're, they have, they have some sort of evolutionary advantage. And I'm sure this is correct. I'm sure that stories, evolved or, or the, the kind of urge to tell stories did kind of emerge from our uh, sort of a fundamental need to communicate. 
with um, each other. And what those sorts of stories do is they give us this, um, you know, that they serve as an instrument of social cohesion. And that's really wonderful. I don't, when I want to sit down with my uh, daughters at the dinner table or my friends, I, I want to tell them fun stories. I want to tell them stories that they can respond to immediately and, you know, we, have, we can enjoy. And that's great. But that's not the kind of story that I'm trying to tell when I'm writing fiction. And, or indeed, when I'm doing science. And one um, experience that I had that helped me put together what we're really trying to do, scientists, writers, all of us, when we create, construct a narrative, is this fantastic object that I found in the National Gallery. And this goes by the name of a Dutch peep show, which is kind of um, fun. And what it is, is um, a box that was constructed by Samuel van Hoogstraten, forgive my Dutch pronunciation, um, in, in, I guess, must be the 16th century when they were all obsessed with perspective. And it's a, basically, it's a perspective box. It's a box and one side of it is um, clear and lets in light. And if you look through that side, what you see is a jumble of images. And you're like, what is this? What's going on in this? On the five sides of the box are painted in a way that absolutely they look like a cubist painting. But on the sides of the box are these holes. That, and if you look through the holes, the whole thing coheres. And what, what you see is this very elaborate interior of a Dutch house. And so... I think that these objects can help us what internal laws, um, understand the internal laws obeyed by narratives, both in science and literature, which do often depart from the traditional linear form and yet avoid, in Aldo Rossi's words, the arbitrary order that is an indifference to, uh, arbitrary disorder that is an indifference to order. Okay, I think I'll finish there. Tenim 10 minuts per preguntes. We have 10 minutes for questioning. One thing I want, I want to say, nevertheless, uh, um, you're having your translation. I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Una cosa que volia yeah. dir, yeah? Una cosa que volia dir és fer-vos notar uh, que la Camil ahir va dir que um, un exercici que ells feien com a, com a actors, com a, com a cine, com, no sé, com, com per escalfar la imaginació, era anar parlant, 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 sense parar, sense parar, sense parar, fins a oblidar-te del significat de lo que volies dir, i anar parlant, anar parlant, anar parlant, fins a un moment que ja les paraules eren només so, i quan eren només so, esperar que la bona idea apareixés. Recordeu? I recordeu que ell es va posar a cantar? I si us posa els pèls de punta? Uh, quan la Sonetra va venir a Barcelona a veure l'exposició Freqüències de l'Eugènia Balcells, uh, a la sortida estava molt commocionada ella i les seves dues filles. Hi havia un, un, uh, una pantalla d'ordinador on podies deixar la teva, el teu comentari. I aleshores les... ella li va dir a les seves filles, escriviu aquí. I elles van dir, bueno, és que ho hem de pensar, no podem escriure. I els va dir, escriu, 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 fins que ja no vulguis escriure més i desitja que en aquest moment tinguis la bona idea. Des d'aquell dia jo sempre més ho he fet. I uh, realment crec que la seva escriptura té molt a veure en això, i la porta a un registre on el que escrius se t'escriu. Mentre que en el registre científic el que escrius és el que escrius. Només volia fer notar aquest paral·lelisme perquè el trobo tan bonic 
i segur que la Miriam estaria d'acord, no? Que les bones traduccions apareixen en el moment que t'estàs luxant o que no estàs per la labor, no? És el vostre torn. Thank you for that beautiful talk. I'm wondering, because I sadly haven't read your fiction, but I will now, So what would a fractal narrative look like? So a fractal narrative is one that emerges just as, as Lali just said, um, through the considerations out, out of the actual writing of the prose. It's an emergent property. It's sort of what we call endogenously generated. It arises out of the components, the necessary components of the prose. So it's not imposed beforehand. And so in it you might see, I think anyway, a lot of um, backwards and forwards. So at some level, I mean in time, for example, it might not be, um, it might be, you know, it might not have that linear element of time because time of course is the best way to organize a linear narrative. So once you break time, you're already departing from the linear narrative. But what it also crucially contains is a, is a sense of order despite what looks like disorder, what looks like, it's not random, it's not as if you have just put down whatever came into your head at whatever time, you don't just, it, it emerges, a sense of, a structure emerges and it's not, it's a complex structure, it's not very straightforward to see, but it's there and you can perceive it. You perceive it as a, as a writer, that this has emerged, this is there and this is a valid structure. It's not disorder. And as a reader, you appreciate it, that it's not just people, someone randomly kind of putting together bits and pieces of stuff. It, it's funny that um, I think in the, in the moment of the boom of Latin American literature, they were experimenting with these things. I think um, 100 Years of Solitude on your on your slide mm -hmm. would be the circular structure. Mm -hmm. And this isn't fractal, but in a way the fragmentation is trying to do something similar of, mm -hmm. of, of um, Hopscotch by Julio Cortázar. Mm -hmm. I don't know, know where he, Hopscotch. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, it's mm -hmm. a, it, it is both linear and Mm -hmm. and completely fragmented, and, and you, can, you can read it either way. It's, a, it's an amazing experiment. Okay, well, sounds like I know <laughs> But anyway, I, thank you very much. It's very, comment. very su mm -hmm. suggestive. It's wonderful. Nevertheless, would, uh, mm, when I think in your novels, of any way, this theme, el veig una mica diferent del tema Cortázar i tot això, i fins i tot 100 anys de soledat, perquè hi ha una cosa en les seves novel·les, que és que hi ha un trasfons social molt ampli, molt dens, amb moltes relacions, i vas veient, o sigui, hi ha alguns moments en què el conjunt és el tema, és el protagonista. I aleshores, d'aquest conjunt van emergint el que seran després els personatges de la novel·la. Però aquest fons no es perd mai. I a mi em fa pensar, li David, en des... en aquestes sessions de jazz que hi ha una improvisació constant i l'orquestra t'acompanya sempre i està sempre present, i perquè l'orquestra està present, tu pots fer el teu solo de trompeta o de clarinet o el que sigui, de piano, no? I aleshores tornes a entrar en aquesta pluralitat, però sense aquesta pluralitat no tindries aquesta singularitat. Jo crec que les teves novel·les... Em fa molt raro parlar amb tu en català, eh? Però... Aquestes... It's fun. Maybe we should do this more often. If I look at you, I can't. Però el que vull dir és que en les teves novel·les el plural i el singular es troben d'una manera extraordinària a cada pàgina. Però jo inclús penso que també en el teu pensar científic 
en aquests tipus de temes que t'interessen, de la vacunació que ens interessa tant en la nostra família, amb el Xavier i tot això, el plural està sempre unit al singular. És a dir, una vacuna, potser... Llàstima que no hi sigui el Xavier, però una vacuna potser és un plural que afecta després singularment a una població, però és un plural. I un s'ha de vacunar pel plural, no pel singular. I em sembla que aquest és un tema fonamental en tu. I en això sí que penso que quan tu em deies vine a veure la meva mare a Calcuta perquè és com aquesta senyora africana que em deia els grans heu de comprar la segona residència a l'Àfrica, és aquesta sensació que ser singular només s'ho pot ser dintre de l'estimació del plural. O sigui, si aquestes jornades ens estan anant tan bé és simplement perquè l'amistat que ens uneix, no només els ponents, sinó amb la majoria dels assistents, té una força que subratlla d'una manera extraordinària la singularitat de cadascú de nosaltres. No, jo vaig dir que, primer de tot, la música és un tipus de tipus de template. És un tipus de tipus de tipus. Una de les coses que volia fer when I eventually finish writing this book, um, in order to finish writing this book, is to understand the thinking behind harmony and what, because as you say, it provides this kind of, it anchors. We, what we want is to live in that boundary between order and disorder, between the plural and the singular, and, and as you say, derive from the plural the, um, the energy to be singular. And I think that music is, is, is a wonderful kind of metaphor for how you know you have these very strict again almost mathematical relationships between the parts but that allows it permits it energizes this individuality at the best in the best sense of the, of that word um, and I, I'm, I'm very flattered but I I mean <laughs> it's nice to think and there may be some truth in it that one of the reasons that I'm able to do or particularly with this flu case, that I came up with a completely different theory was because I was thinking in a different way. Yeah. I was abandoning the linear narrative of flu yeah. and saying, no, let's, let's look at another way of telling this yeah. story. Well, I'm so sorry, but we need to finish that, but I don't want not to uh, formulate a last question to you, which is, uh, w when do you feel closer to the mystery of life whenever you are in your Oxford uh, laboratory or whenever you are at home at night with a little bit of wine and your pages and your pen? Um, I think that I'm very privileged in that I am constantly exposed. I mean, I, I, every, I mean, in both cases, I just feel, I feel the mystery of life constantly and, and acutely, and I think that's what holds my life together. And being here is an intensely, um, an intense example, an intense experience of mystery. So thank you very much for that.